Welcome to Mount Prospect Public Library's Library Life. I'm Kathy Cushing. Today we'll visit with author Tyra Manning to discuss her heartfelt memoir, Where the Water Meets the Sand. We'll also immerse ourselves into some of the most fascinating cultures of the world as we enjoy the splendor of Chinese folk and classical dance, as well as the many aspects of the library's traditional Dia de los Niños, Dia de los Libros celebration. But first, let's take a virtual trip around the world with an international opera program promising opera for everyone. Mount Prospect Public Library patrons enjoy some of the world's most beautiful music. During this Main Street Opera event, presented in celebration of our village's centennial. We worked with the library to create uh, a program that is from around the world. So we have a wonderful selection of music from the Americas, both North America and South America, Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asia as well. We found that by doing this diversity of countries, cultures and genre, there was actually a linkage that came together. So you're going to see in this program how music from Spain influences France, influences uh, the, the Bohemian countries and vice versa. Wagnerian soprano Catherine Bergman is the founder and executive director of this Arlington Heights based opera company. I've been surrounded with music my entire life. I have a musical degree along with a, a business and accounting degree. So Main Street Opera was a way for me to do what I love to do, which is sing opera, and at the same time be a coach, be a mentor for some of the young individuals coming out of colleges these days, as well as a landing spot for other individuals like myself who consider music and opera an advocation. Um, but it's, they're not basing their mortgage on it, so to speak. So we have a wonderful combination of experiences that uh, we're able to bring out here into the suburbs. And uh, we have developed a following for those who enjoy these kind of operas in an intimate setting. This library event features five talented Chicago area musicians performing the works of a diverse selection of composers with a range that spans everything from classical arias to contemporary operettas. We have a wonderful combination of individuals today. So um, starting from the bass voice to the top, we have Dave Govertson. He is a full-time singer and teacher. He's been seen a number of times uh, on the Lyric Opera stage. Uh, we have uh, Jesus Alfredo Jimenez Jimenez, who is an emerging talent. He's got a wonderful tenor voice, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to him. You have Angela Torres Kutkun, who is our mezzo-soprano. She, like myself, is uh, actively involved in the music world, but also in the working world. And then to this time, I will be performing the soprano role uh, for, this, for this Opera for Everyone program. <laughs> We always enjoy um, helping uh, our patrons celebrate, and so I will be uh, pleased to contribute our little bit to the patrons here at the library and to help the town celebrate its centennial. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, is the nation's largest grassroots organization dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. Joining me on Library Life to discuss her library event presented in conjunction with NAMI is author and educator Dr. Tyra Manning. Welcome. Thank you so much. Dr. Manning, you've battled with depression most of your life. Can you tell us a little bit about your first experiences and when you first realized that something might be wrong? In retrospect, um, my father died uh, when I was nine years old. He died at the age of 36 mm -hmm. and um, he died of a heart attack. Um, and I was extremely close to my father. Um, it was one of those days, uh, 1956, where I was daddy's little girl and my brother was mom's little boy and we did things together in partnerships. And yet I knew that my father was ill because I'd heard my aunts talking about the fact that he was very ill and mm -hmm. my mother and father traveled a lot going to 
different doctors and hospitals across the United States looking for a cure. Right. He had he had arteriosclerosis, but it was so bad that he died at the age of 36. And mm -hmm. at that time, we didn't have many of the things, the the medical practices that we have today. Right. So during that time that they were traveling, they'd come home for a while and then they'd leave again. That whole fear of losing daddy was was very clear mm -hmm. and, and very strong. Um, as a result of that, um, I had a, um, a difficult teenage time. Mm -hmm. and, but in um, 1970, 69, I met the love of my life. But his dream was to be an Air Force pilot, and I knew that when we married. And um, we were, um, he finished te Texas Tech University in Lubbock before I did. Mm -hmm. And he was stationed back in Lubbock for pilot training. That was during the Vietnam War. And he knew and I knew that when he finished his pilot training and earned his wings, in all probability, he would be deployed to Vietnam. And by this time, you and Larry have a daughter, Laura. How did you deal with your anxiety? Once he was deployed and he did get his orders, I became more and more frightened and scared and in retrospect, depressed. Um, Larry left for Vietnam. And even prior to that, I had started secretly drinking and doing, I became bulimic, but I would keep that from Larry as I was trying to deal with and coping. Mm -hmm. I knew I couldn't ask him not to, to go. It was right. the dream of his life. And, um, and because I, I knew that, I couldn't do that. So after he left, I was speaking with my gynecologist. He asked me how I was doing, and he said, doesn't seem like you're doing great. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him I wasn't, that I missed Larry. I couldn't sleep. I was having trouble with my studies. I was still at the university. And so he, he said to me, I have a friend who's a new psychiatrist in town. You should go see him. I did. And um, my depression grew, grew worse, and he... Um, I was hospitalized at Methodist Hospital mm -hmm. on the psychiatric ward. Mm -hmm. That happened twice. And the second time he said to me, Tyra, if you'll go to the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, that Carl Menninger and family started, right. um, you can get better faster. So I left Seminole, Texas, and where I had been staying with my mother. Right. Uh, I left our baby girl and I went to Topeka, Kansas to the Menninger Clinic. Um, I wanted to get well, and Larry and I had been talking on cassette tapes that um, I'd meet him in Hawaii where the water meets the sand for R&R, &R, and mm -hmm. he'd say, get better, hon, so you can meet me um, mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Um, when I arrived at the Menninger Clinic, um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. Right. And clinical depression is a severe, it's, it's not like someone's, people who suffer from depression or clinical depression, it's not like, oh, I'm not having a good day, I feel depressed. It's not like that. It's an right. illness that needs, that p people who suffer with it or their families need treatment. While I was there, Larry was killed, um, and I couldn't have been in a better place. When I left Menninger after eight months, um, I was able to function, I, I was doing great. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved our baby to Topeka, and I s decided to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, I still lacked a year on my bachelor's degree, so I started back to college. You know, you mentioned that you're going to meet Larry where the water meets the yes. sand, and that is the title of your That's book correct. that you sat down and decided to write. Why did you feel compelled to write this book? I wanted to honor Larry mm -hmm. and our daughter, but I became very close to the patients that were at Menninger. And I call Menninger my own peculiar finishing school. <laughs> um, and over the years, as I got better and finished my doctorate and became a principal and a superintendent of schools, I might share that I'd been a, a, a patient at the Menninger Clinic. And so many times, those dear friends would say, oh, Tyra, you weren't like those people. Mm. And I would say, you have to understand, I had the credentials. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to honor those people that I lived with on the unit. 
and the book has stories about them and how important they were to me and how we got better together. And I wanted, the mission is to try to work hard to diminish the stigma that keeps people talking about their illness or afraid to get help because there's the stigma. Of course. To seek treatment or family members feel embarrassed or if it's their first time, not always, but they start dealing with a family member or a child that, that is diagnosed with a mental illness. So years ago, I promised myself I'd write this book and finally after retiring two or three times, uh, I've been able to do it. And those are the reasons and to speak out. We also, particularly in terms of veterans um, and all people, there are many people that aren't able to find good treatment right. uh, or to afford good treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's my life's mission now, is to work on that. Now you have an expression that you use in the book, weller than well. Yes. Why does that phrase mean so much to you? Well, Dr. Carl wrote a book and I learned about it. Some of the patients talked about it when I became a, a patient at Menager. And I went mm -hmm. in 1970 and, and left in 71. Um, I'm sorry, left in 70. Um, but. They talked about the fact that Dr. Carl wrote in his book that with treatment, people can get better, weller than well. And mm -hmm. what he meant by that is with great treatment and support, people may get better than they've ever been, weller than well. And in the book, when I was talking about being a patient there, and I had my own friends, and we were higher functioning, I thought, who knows? <laughs> but human beings have a way of having a pecking order. You of know? course, yes. You see that in schools, mm -hmm. if, if grown-ups don't make sure that that's not prevalent or active. And it happened there. Those of us who, um, at that particular time, uh, could have, could be qualified to go on a, a walk with an aide and leave the unit down to the pond mm -hmm. or go to the dining room with supervision where others had to eat on trays as I did my first two weeks there. Right. So weller than well, I decided, well, those of us who can do these things, we're, we're getting weller than well. <laughs> so I had that problem myself about, and, but I wanna be clear. And if you've read the book, there's a, the people who were very ill loved in their own way. The night Larry was killed and they found out about it, the staff told everybody. Mm -hmm. They invited me to come to the patient lounge to be with them. So the name of that chapter is Be With Us. And in their own way, they reached out and told me they were sorry. And some, they played special music they knew I would like. So there was a camaraderie there. It was like a family bringing somebody, coming to see someone mm -hmm. who had lost a loved one. That sensitivity, no matter how ill they were, they were all there. I'd like to talk a little bit about the addictions that you were mentioning yes. and how you conquered them. Because that's quite a few addictions, drinking, bulimia, and even the cutting. Um, the bulimia um, was the first addiction and somebody said to me how did you know to do that and I said I didn't know to do that it was just instinctive mm -hmm. um, the cutting was in was raising the bar and I why did I do that I don't know it was instinctive when I had terrible anxiety back then when I was so ill as a young woman my nose would burn the anxiety would be so hard. I would describe my my nose as being, it, it must have, it felt like it would have looked like uh, Rudolph. It just would burn. Mm -hmm. And that was a sign that my anxiety was rising to me internally. That's how I understood it. Right. And when I would do, when I would eat and throw up, or if I would cut myself, back then when I was so ill, I remember thinking it was as if the bad feelings and the bad would, would bleed out. Very, as I tell you this today, it sounds, but- uh, It was sort of a release for you. It was though, a release right? for me. Mm -hmm. It worked. And that's all I knew at that time. I was so miserable, but it worked. When I, 
was a child, a teenager, and I started driving, I would go out to Daddy's grave. And when I got to be old enough, I would buy beer and go out there. Mm -hmm. So I had a propensity for addictions, for things to, to, and as a young woman after I left, I became addicted to alcohol. Um, I functioned, but I knew, I knew I had a problem and I reached out for help. And those um, problems are always sort of there, looming. I will right? tell you the reason I came, became really so confronted, I was director of personnel for a large school district. Mm -hmm. And part of my job was the employee's assistance program. And I was great at getting people to go get help. And I kept saying to myself, self, <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe you need to take advantage of this. And the truth of the matter is, I did go to a support program, and um, I got sober in July the 1st, 1981, and um, I'm so grateful. So it was a struggle for it was, so I many years. I had a years. propensity. Yeah. It, I wasn't drinking all the time during that period when I was a youngster after, I became, after Larry and I married, but later on it be, I picked it up again. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't bulimic or cutting during all that time. That quit when I left Minigur. But human beings sometimes find ways to cope, and those were my coping mechanisms. Later on, I can remember um, having children in my school as a principal who mm -hmm. girls were eating and throwing up, or eating at lunchtime, throwing up, in, in, the late, in the girls' restroom. And because I knew what that was and how that could become addictive, I had a teacher that, that supervised the restrooms. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then if we saw that somebody was having that problem, they went to the counselor and we contacted their parents. So there, I'm not suggesting uh, that, it's, that my life was easy, but the great news is I had great treatment. Mm -hmm. I got better. I was able to contribute, and um, it was redemptive to be able to get to to have the kind of treatment I have. And I want other people to have that. Um, I would like to just circle back because um, we are going to start oh, running out of time. But I, I you, in two thousand six, mm -hmm. you had a little bit of closure with regard yes. to Larry, yes. in that his remains were found. Right. 35 years after yes. he was shot down. Yes. Tell us, um, was that closure for you? Did you feel that that was something that you needed? I made a promise to Larry as a young man before he went to Vietnam that if he didn't come home, he'd be buried at Arlington. Mm -hmm. That always was in the back of my mind. And I always believed that one day that would happen. I know it sounds nutty, but I believed that it would happen. Mm -hmm. It wasn't closure, it was, a, it was a promise kept. Right. And 36 men, who, 18 who flew with him out of Da Nang into Laos, where mm -hmm. his plane actually went down, and 18 who were in pilot training with him came to that funeral. And people from my school district, where I'd been superintendent, and parents came. And Larry's life was celebrated, but Laura got to hear from those men on the ground when, where Larry's plane went down what happened to her father. And she got to hear about him from them. And it meant everything for her to hear what he was like in Vietnam and how he was, his courage, and what a good guy he was. And that he loved her and he talked about her all the time to them. I could never have done that for her. Mm -mm. So it was priceless. Well, I thank you so much for being with me today. This I has been you. so inspirational. You can find Dr. Manning's book, Where the Water Meets the Sand, at bookstores everywhere. For more information on this or any upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library event, call the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. Each year, the Mount Prospect Public Library celebrates Dia de los Niños, Dia de los Libros, Children's Day Book Day, with a series of entertaining and educational activities. Let's take a look at this year's colorful event. 
Borrowing from the traditional Mexican holiday, El Dia de los Niños, the American version, officially designated by the U.S. Congress as the Day of the Child, has been adding a reading component since 1997. Dia de los Niños, Dia de los Libros is an annual program that celebrates children, it celebrates um, different cultures, and it also celebrates um, reading and an enjoyment of reading and understanding of one another. This Mount Prospect Public Library celebration promises something for everyone, packing a bevy of activities into a fun-filled hour and a half. Today we will be watching a performance of dances around the world. We're also going to get a chance to learn a couple of dance steps. And then um, we will have stations with science, technology, engineering, arts, and math activities. We'll also have a snack where we get to try some food from different countries and everyone receives a free book. A 10-year-old Chicago-based organization known as Dancing with Class kicks off the festivities, demonstrating dances from around the world. We teach in Chicago public schools mostly and all throughout the suburbs and sometimes we partner with teachers during the school day, sometimes we teach in after school programs, but we teach a lot of social and cultural dances. Teaching artist Megan Rhyme and her dance partner Itza Ritas introduce their young audience members to a variety of cultures while inviting them to learn a dance step or two. Today uh, we are doing a little bit of salsa and um, tango. The korobori is sort of uh, Aboriginal Australian dances and we're going to be doing one that's kind of tells the story of like a bird catching a fish. And then uh, we're going to finish up with a little bit of Bollywood. So we've got sort of a routine that's sort of inspired by Bollywood and the Bollywood film industry. In Bollywood they actually mix a lot of different dance styles together. Traditional Indian dance styles such as Bhangra or Bharat and then mix it together with like hip-hop and jazz and um, comes up with some really fun dances. Vale, vale. I give a little bit of history that's one thing that's really important to us as an organization is um, sort of uh, honoring the cultural history and heritage where, of where all these dances come from. One goal that I always have for my students when I'm teaching cultural dances is for them to use the dance as like a little window into another culture and to be like oh yeah Experiencing another culture can be really great and something that's exciting and like appreciating that diversity of experience. After dancing with class, families continue their journey around the world by visiting five activity stations representing various cultures and teaching the elements of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. STEAM is important to us because we want uh, to connect those uh, real-world in-demand skills with reading, um, with the library, and show that it's something that uh, is for everyone. So at the science station, um, we'll be going to Brazil and learning about animals and which habitats they live in. At the technology station, we're going to Japan and we're learning about robots. We're going to use Google Earth to try and find some Japanese locations. At engineering, we're going to be building pyramids like the Mexican pyramids. At art, we're going to be making Turkish mosaic um, patterns. And then at math, we're going to be doing some number games and counting with uh, Kenya. My goals are that everyone have fun, that they learn something new about the world around them, and hopefully the other people in the community. Events highlighting the cultures of our world are abundant here at the Mount Prospect Public Library, as well as materials that chronicle journeys taken both physically and spiritually. Here with her best book pick from the Adult Services Department is business manager Carla Peterson. The Barn at the End of the World, The Apprenticeship of a Quaker Buddhist Shepherd by Mary Rose O'Reilly is a rich narrative of the author's midlife journey into sheep barns and spirituality. In 98 short vignettes, O'Reilly lets us into her life. She gives us a look at raising sheep in Minnesota and a glimpse of monastery life at Plum Village in France. We are introduced to some of her teachers, a young barn worker who says, never turn your back on a buck ram, a spiritual director who shares, it's nice to be calm but the real purpose of meditation is to obtain wisdom. Quotes from poets find their way into the book 
We hear from Robert Frost, Mary Oliver, Walt Whitman, and others. We learn that the author relishes the Augustinian phrase, the tranquility of order. The Barn at the End of the World, highly recommended as an oasis for busy lives. Recommendations from the Adult Services Department this month are spiritual memoirs. In Traveling Mercies by Anne Lamott, the author draws upon her somewhat troubled past to explore the many ways in which faith sustains and guides one's daily life. The Journey Home, Autobiography of an American Swami by Red Hanneth Swami follows the journey of suburban Chicagoan Richard Slavin as he transforms from young seeker to renowned spiritual guide. In The Sound of Gravel, author Ruth Warner describes coming of age in a polygamist Mormon doomsday cult, the extreme religious beliefs haunting her daily life, and her escape in the wake of a devastating tragedy. Seeking Enlightenment, Hat by Hat by Nevada Barr recounts the author's spiritual quest for meaning in her life and Autobiography of a Yogi by Parabahansa Yogananda is an early 19th century yogi's account of the religious milestones in her life. Recommendations from the Youth Services Department this month combine music with competition. In The Million Dollar Throw by Mike Lupica, the chance to win a million dollars in a competition has a lot riding on it for a boy, his financially troubled family, and a sick friend. Just Juice by Karen Hess tells the tale of a nine-year-old who decides to go back to school and help her family after her dad is laid off of work. In Rock and Roll Rebel by Ginger Rue, a perceived troublemaker starts an all-girl band with her cousin and two friends from school. A Crooked Kind of Perfect by Linda Urban relays the story of a girl who longs to learn how to play piano, but is forced to play the organ instead. And in McKinsey Blue by Tina Wells, a girl worries that her chance to participate in the teen sing contest has moved to France with her best friend. Finally, here's Youth Services Assistant Ann Wilson with her best book pick from this department. In I Am Drums by Mike Grosso, drums are Sam's life. Music is everywhere, in her head and her heart at all times. Sam even builds her own drum kit out of her encyclopedias and Calvin and Hobbes books so she can practice and teach herself. This is an inspiring story of what Sam does when she realizes she needs a drum teacher to help her get better. She has to figure out a way to pay for drum lessons since her family can't afford it, and she goes against her parents' wishes to do that. She learns the hard way that it is better to communicate and talk to her family rather than trying to solve the problem on her own. This would be a good story to read if you have a strong desire to develop a talent and are not sure how to get there. This story was funny, sad, cool, and I was rooting for Sam to figure out her dream. The performing arts often provide windows through which audience members can view ancient customs. Let's enjoy a Super Saturday performance displaying the rich traditions of Chinese folk and classical dance. The ancient traditions and colorful splendor of Chinese folk and classical dance are on display here at the Mount Prospect Public Library during this Super Saturday event presented through Urban Gateways. Urban Gateway is an educational uh, center as a nonprofit organization to promote the art through many ways. Choreographer and performer Olinda Chung has been working with Urban Gateways for two decades. Today, she is being joined on stage by her daughter, Samantha Chi. She is one of my most favorite students, and she has been performing with me when she was tiny. Uh, and think, since this is a family event, we like to bring you the modern daughter dance and to see as a family. Together, we can do something. This entertaining cultural event, which is funded by the Mount Prospect Public Library Foundation, presents seven unique dances from the diverse provinces of China. 
We will do the uh, banquet hall. We use the play chopsticks cup. And the second one will be doing the long ribbon things. It symbolizes the rainbow in the high mountains. I uh, will also doing the solo dance for the sword dance. And uh, we also doing the classical fan dance, feather fan. And we also will do the Kung Fu fan, martial arts. The last one will be the ribbon dance um, that symbolizes the beautiful or our colorful world. Young patrons are invited to learn a few dance moves and absorb the intricacies that permeate the Chinese culture. Our nowadays culture is fusion. And so through Chinese dance, I can pass some of them to know more about this very unique and one of the oldest civilization of the whole history and they're willing to study it more. Urban Gateway's Chinese folk and classical dance is just one example of the many entertaining, informational, and educational events featured here at the Mount Prospect Public Library every month. Don't miss any library programs you'd like to experience. Here's a list of events scheduled in June and July. Reservations are strongly recommended. For more information regarding these events, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. You will also find a listing and description of all upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library events in your library newsletter preview. The fun-filled season of summer is now underway. Time for cookouts, pool parties, and evening concerts under the stars. With this in mind, our Library Life camera today asks the question, what is your favorite aspect of summer and why? Here are some responses. We love to go to Centennial Beach in Naperville. Um, it's a really nice uh, place to play in the water and then um, a good sand to play into. Our favorite family tradition is to go downtown and spend a day uh, either on the beach or walking around. I would have to say, you know, just hanging out outside with my family, going swimming and just having so much fun just because it's fun to get outside and just hang out and get sun and just get that fresh air. That wraps up this edition of Library Life. Don't forget to sign up for our 2017 summer reading program. Reading by Design, running now through July 31st. For more information on this or any of the Mount Prospect Public Library services and events highlighted here, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org.